So the uh, next speaker this morning is uh, Emily Case from uh, Smith Academy in Hatfield. And I think it's just so appropriate that the next uh, speaker is a, a teacher in the public school system. I mentioned last night that for Lynn, science was teaching and teaching was science and it was all rolled into one. And um, I think that that was an important part of what Lynn brought to the university to help scientists understand that they had to be teachers and that help teachers understand that they needed to be scientists. And um, it's really been, a, it was a special relationship that she had, always having teachers in her laboratory for her whole time here at the university. So Emily. Good morning. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak. I think Lynn would be pleased to have her educational legacy recognized Thank you. <laughs> and I'm honored to represent the many teachers who benefited from Lynn's work. As I planned this tribute, I felt conflicted between what I wanted to say and what I think Lynn would have wanted me to say. I feel pretty sure that she would have been appalled to learn that I planned to talk about her for the entire 15 minutes. I can envision how she would have marked up drafts of my talk in her inimitable editing style, if given the chance. Lynn would have wanted me to tell you about the many fine curriculum units, educational DVDs, and books that she produced, as well as the digital interactive lectures that Jim just mentioned by dozens of eminent scientists, many of whom are here today, that Lynn recorded and preserved. And I hope that you will find out more about these materials because they comprise a unique and wonderful collection that reflects what Lynn valued in both science and education. However, as my friend and fellow teacher Sonia Vickers reminds me, Lynn's most important legacy is not in her publications, excellent though they are, but in the classrooms of the many teachers that she taught. I first met Lynn in 1997 when I enrolled as a graduate student in her signature course, Environmental Evolution. Lynn was then working on a curriculum unit for high school biology involving reconstructing past environments using fossil foraminifera and recruited me to help as a summer job. I had been working in a bakery and Lynn was fond of saying that she found me at a donut counter. As many here can attest, I was by no means the only student that Lynn rescued from menial labor and I think it was a particular point of pride with her. I returned to the Margulis Lab every summer thereafter. No other coursework or professional development can compete with hanging around Lynn for staying current in my curriculum area. And I also feel a great camaraderie with the many people that I've worked with at the Margulis Lab. As Steve Goodwin mentioned last night, you can't imagine a more eclectic group of people. A list of our interests and avocations begins to sound like a joke something along the lines of a bouncer, a ballet dancer, and a Buddhist walk into a lab. <laughs> but here's the punchline. They all walk out with advanced degrees and a few publications under their belts. One of the difficulties I've faced since losing Lynn is explaining to people what she meant to me and what our relationship was. The scientist I worked for in the summers sounds awkward and cold, and I once heard Lynn herself object to this type of description. My friend um, and fellow Margulis Lab employee, Jeremy Jorgensen, who's also a teacher, once introduced himself to a group of Lynn students by saying, I work for Lynn. She made a disapproving sound, so he looked at her a moment and then amended, I work for science with Lynn. Of this, she approved. Lynn was my employer, my mentor, my editor, my co-author, my friend. But where I'm landing in my heart is that she was first and foremost my teacher in the oldest and deepest sense of the word. I don't need to tell this audience about Lynn's vast expertise, her unparalleled knowledge of Earth and its live beings 
To be an apprentice to all that was a profound experience. One of my recent tasks at the Margulis Lab was to create a catalog of images that Lynn collected over her career. Sean Faulkner, who's another student of Lynn's, and I each spent hours peering at micrographs of all kinds that were scanned from unlabeled or illegible photographic slides. We'd set aside images that we could not identify for weeks or months until Lynn was available to help. How do you imagine this went? Most people who hire someone to perform a task like this will have an interest in efficiency. Lynn, presented with the first picture, takes a slow, deep breath and says, oh, this is very interesting. <laughs> with dozens or hundreds of images to identify, Lynn would spend an hour explaining just two or three of them to Sean or myself. And at the time, it was fairly frustrating. But in retrospect, I see that she was always a teacher, and the diffusion of knowledge was more important to her than the completion of the image database. Taking courses from Lynn and working in her lab was a total immersion experience. When I first met her through that fateful environmental evolution course, I was only a few years out of college. I had graduated with honors and a degree in biology from a reputable institution and expected to be well prepared for Lynn's course. I was not. Every time I thought we were entering familiar territory, mitosis or genetics, I would quickly learn that everything I knew applied only to animals or sometimes to plants and that's not at all to the content of this course. My previous teachers had taught me a great deal. Lynn taught me how much more there is to know. The incredible diversity of metabolic and reproductive strategies among microbes and their evolutionary and planetary implications. This was her field, and I've been coming back for 15 years to learn more at her side. Lynn's teaching style was unique. The best description I've heard of Lynn as a teacher comes from Aaron Hazelton, who was a student of Lynn's when I first met him and is now a professor at SUNY New Paltz. Aaron was showing a group of new environmental evolution students, room 318, which Jim just mentioned, where the teaching materials are housed. The students' faces betrayed a look of bewilderment common to new students of Lynn's. So Aaron stopped explaining how to find materials and started to describe the experience of learning from Lynn. Some teachers, he said, present the materials sequentially like this. He had a pen and in the air he traced a neat little outline. Others emphasize main ideas and connections. Here he sketched a concept web. Lynn, she dismantles the pen and empties all of the ink onto the page at once. Total immersion. They don't teach this technique in education schools, <laughs> but Lynn was by far the best teacher I've ever had. Earlier I described the legion of teachers that Lynn has taught as her most important educational legacy. I'd like to explain why. In education at all levels, we necessarily simplify concepts to meet the needs of our learners. This is an important, difficult, and delicate task. And when it comes to evolution and symbiosis, the standard curricula and textbooks botch the job. The symbiogenetic origin of chloroplasts and mitochondria in high school textbooks is always found inside a box, not in the chapter about evolution, but in a chapter about cells. We all know what boxes mean. To students, the box means that the information is not going to be on the test. <laughs> to writers and editors, boxes are for neat little facts that don't really fit in with the overall story. I'm going to come back to this. The mathematician Johann von Neumann said, in mathematics, we don't understand things, 
We just get used to them. I think the same could be said for science and probably for any field. In biology, we must take great care to consider just what it is we are getting used to. Is it the astonishing diversity of organisms, life histories, metabolic activities, biochemical pathways and fossils that we see in nature? Or are we simply becoming accustomed to the categories, generalizations, and stories we've created to help our limited minds understand life's complexity? The power of Lynn's scientific ideas comes from her profound knowledge of life itself. Our theories and taxonomies must stand up to ground truthing at the level of the organism, and Lynn spent a lot of time on the ground, not to mention in the mud. An example of what I mean comes from an exchange between Lynn and Richard Dawkins a few years ago at Oxford in a debate titled Homage to Darwin. Dawkins, if you take the standard story for ordinary animals, you've got a distribution of animals, you've got a promontory, so you end up with two distributions, and then on either side you get different selection pressures, and so one starts to evolve this way, and one starts to evolve that way. And what's wrong with that? It's highly plausible, it's economical, it's parsimonious. Why on earth would you want to drag in symbiogenesis when it's so unparsimonious and uneconomical? Lynn, because it's there. <laughs> so about those boxes in these textbooks, it's time to take symbiogenesis out of the box and put it where it belongs in the main text of the evolution chapter. I'd like to close by sharing a few stories from my classroom this year because I have found comfort in the enthusiasm and wonderment of my young life science students and hope that you will too. Last summer, Lynn urged me to focus my own teaching on the organisms themselves, their bodies, their activities, their environments. Recently, when planning a unit on reproduction and heredity, I recalled Lynn's advice and made the basis of my lesson 12 organisms representing all five kingdoms with reproductive strategies ranging from binary fission to parthenogenesis. I knew I was doing right by Lynn when in the middle of the lesson, a girl looked up at me with wide eyes and said in an awestruck voice, I like seriously did not know any of this before. <laughs> The second story I'd like to share is about an extraordinary young man in my class, and I can take no credit for his work except to say that I didn't get in his way, which is, I imagine, what Lynn's best teachers would have said about their work with her. The week that I learned of Lynn's stroke, my students were giving presentations on organ systems. Most had chosen to study human body systems, and a few discussed systems in plants. This young man chose fungi. In the midst of good but standard discussions of human digestion and the like, comes a brilliant, captivating, well-researched presentation on the organization of cells, tissues, and organs in the Basidio mycota. Later, when we studied endangered species among the whales and polar bears and chinchillas, was the rock gnome lichen from the same student. To honor Lynn, I am resolved to remember that the truth on the ground is more important, messier, but ultimately more beautiful than the elegance of our explanations. I will breathe life into science education and liberate Lynn's ideas from their boxes. Finally, I will take heart in the knowledge that the next generation still shows wonderment at the diversity of life, including the lichens and the fungi. Thank you.